Now let's see, we have just worked out how much energy you get when you fuse one kilogram of hydrogen into helium and that 0.7% gets converted into pure energy and the one kilo gave us, what was it, 10 to the 15 joules or that's 10 to the 15 watts for one second which sounds like an enormous amount of energy, but wait a minute. The sun is actually currently putting out four times 10 to the 26 joules every second. Let's see. So how many kilograms of hydrogen does it need if each kilogram is only giving 10 to the 15? You can see immediately that we need four times 10 to the 11 kilos, 400 billion kilos of hydrogen to fuse into helium every second for simply to explain the amount of power coming out of the sun right now. Gosh, that's a lot. And that is what is determining the balance between gas pressure that's holding the sun up against gravity, which is pushing it down. And you might now be worrying, wait a minute, I know the sun is big, but gosh, 400 billion kilos of hydrogen per second? When is it going to run out of fuel? When will all of the center of the sun have been turned into helium, which isn't doing this reaction, not generating power? In fact, this has been going on for some time, and we've now estimated that about half of the helium, uh, sorry, half of the hydrogen in the sun had, in the center has now turned into helium, meaning it's getting a little bit denser, which pushes the temperature up a little bit higher, which tends to even increase the nuclear fusion rate a little bit more. So our best estimates, and there is some geological evidence in support of these best estimates, are that the sun is currently about let's say about 30% more powerful, 30% more watts coming out of it than when it was very young when it was born. So it was born at less than 3 times 10 to the 26 joules, and now uh, it's going at 4. And grad, of course, this takes, as we'll see, billions of years to change. It's an amazingly stable source of energy, which is really wonderful for those lucky planets around it that uh, want to have hundreds of millions or even billions of years to allow life to evolve and develop under remarkably, surprisingly stable conditions. So what I have to say about this is I love hydrogen fusion. It's just the greatest thing since sliced bread because it gives you a very long-lived and very steady source of power that can warm your solar system and your planet. Well, I don't want you to worry, so I'll give you the numbers right now. There is a handout on this also that you can get off the course webpage. How long until the sun burns all of the hydrogen in its core into helium and is out of fuel. What's the lifetime of this fuel supply? Well, that's very easy to figure. We already know what the total mass of the sun is, 2 times 10 to the 30 kilos. But wait a minute, I'm actually only concerned with about the central part of the sun. That's the only place where it's hot enough and the pressure's high enough and so on, and these collisions are violent enough to actually cause fusion. So we don't have uh, the availability of more than about one-tenth of the sun's total mass. I'm going to say about 2 times 10 to the 29 kilos here, and we're div we have to divide this by the current rate of consumption, 4 times 10 to the 11 kilos. And you see here, if I have a fuel supply divided by a rate of consumption, it's just like in your gas tank. Right? If we measure things this way, you've got uh, 20 gallons in your tank and you're burning um, you know, 2 gallons an hour on the freeway, you'll be able to drive your car for 10 hours, right? Well, uh, that's not how we usually measure it, but the principle is the same here. Here I'm going to take the fuel supply in kilos. I divide by the fuel consumption rate, which is kilos per second. The kilos, kilograms of hydrogen cancels out. And what do I have? I have 1 over 1 over seconds, which is seconds. That's how long it'll last. It looks like a big number here. 10 to the 30 divided by 10 to the 29 divided. It's uh, almost 10 to the 18 seconds. It's 3 times 10 to the 17 seconds. Wow. 
10, if you convert knowing that there are 30 million seconds in a year, you get 10 to the 10 years, 10 giga years, 10 billion years for the sun to exhaust its entire fuel supply. Whew, I was a little nervous there. I don't know about you. I was scaring you a lot in these lectures about the sun. Finally, we can relax and say, whew, it's actually only used up a little bit less than half of its fuel supply because we now know that the age of the solar system, presumably the age of the sun also, is only four and a half billion years. And so, of course, as I mentioned before, uh, it's only because it's not, it's using nuclear fusion reactions instead of just uh, these wimpy chemical reactions that the sun has been able to burn at the rate it has for billions of years already, with billions more of years to go along, no problem. So that's nice. So the, the lifetime of a star, when it's burning hydrogen in its core, is potentially very long. In fact, that's the longest phase of the lifetime of any star, always, is when it's burning hydrogen. And let's get back to an earlier lecture when it's on the main sequence. Now we have an insight that explains what's happening inside the star which produces the effects that we see on the outside. It explains the surface temperature of the star, which is basically the size of the star, and the power of the star. The I'll say this, the main sequence is the sequence of all stars of various masses which are currently burning their hydrogen in their cores into the helium. And that's, as I said, that's why most stars are on the main sequence, more than 90%. Why? Because stars spend typically 90% or more of their lifetime in this main sequence phase. They're born quite quickly. They collapse rather rapidly. That only takes a few percent of their lifetime for them to land on the main sequence when uh, a cloud of gas and dust has collapsed under its own gravity to make a star. Then they burn for a long time uh, with hydrogen fusing in the center. Then they run out. And then things start happening quite quickly. It's a rather short but rather spectacular final stages of the lifetime of a star, which I'm going to get to in the next, next lecture. But now, before I go on to that, I've given you all these numbers. And I'll just have a little review slide here. Gosh, this is pretty obvious. This is certainly going to be on the midterm exam. What process creates energy in the sun? Currently, that's fusing hydrogen to helium only in the sun's core, and that's enough to give us the 4 times 10 to the 26 watts. Why is the size of the sun what it is? It's a balance, a gravitational equilibrium between uh, pressure and gravity. And how long will the fuel supply last? This raises an interesting question, which we'll get to in the next lecture, we saw that the main sequence of stars, some of them run a lot hotter than the sun, and they generate much, much more power. So they're consuming their hydrogen fuel supplies much faster. You can see already that those stars are likely to run out of fuel faster than the sun because they're burning it up so much faster. This is one of the great ironies of nature here in stars. The most massive stars, which are the hot ones, the very powerful stars, on the upper left part of the HR diagram, uh, up on the top, high end of the main sequence, you would think that those stars are born with all of the advantages. I don't want to get too uh, anthropomorphic here, but they seem to have it all. They have everything. They have vast, huge fuel supplies. Think of it like a bank account. And yet, they are tearing through it at such a huge rate, maybe hundreds or thousands of times faster than the sun, that they blow their account, they blow their inheritance, they use up all their fuel and run out in their cores in much shorter time than the sun does. On the other hand, if you're at the bottom of the main sequence, those stars, of course, are less massive than the sun. They're burning their fuel very parsimoniously, very slowly. And so even though they start out with less fuel than the sun, they are so miserly in using it up that they can live for much longer on the main sequence. They have a much longer main sequence lifetime than the sun, even though they start out with less fuel. Interesting. I need to now look at the evidence that we actually understand the conditions in the center of the sun well enough to have confidence that our 
cal computations of nuclear reactions are reasonably accurate. The problem is, of course, we cannot see into the sun. It's completely opaque, so we only have mathematical models of the sun about basically how the density and the temperature and the pressure increase as you go from the surface inside to the center of the sun. Here's a lucky, amazing surprise, which was largely exploited by my colleague Roger Ulrich at UCLA, by the way. He and a number of other people, quite a number of, number of decades back, noticed that the sun and other stars actually pulsates a little bit. I don't really want to use the word pulsation, but it, uh, it has small fluctuations in it, which are pretty subtle to measure. Uh, these are basically like earthquakes or sunquakes that are traveling back and forth through the sun. And here's the interesting point. Just like earthquake waves uh, traveling through the interior of the earth, the these waves, or uh, vibrations of the sun, I'll call them, will go from one side of the sun to the next. Uh, some of them are very superficial and just travel along the top of the sun, but some of the waves go right through close to the center of the sun anyway. If you measure how long it takes for these waves to pass across the sun, you're getting a measure of the sound speed, the wave speed, at different locations in the sun. And if you check that, that basically is directly related to the temperature and density of that depth of the sun. I don't expect you to know why this is. Um, it's basically the same way the geologists reconstruct what is the density and the conditions in the center of the Earth. I don't think any of them have been on a field trip down there, but they know pretty accurately for the same reason. Uh, they have to wait for a big earthquake to send a wave. The sun is always uh, vibrating like this. This is just one mode of vibration that's shown here where the red parts are coming up and the blue parts are sinking down. Uh, there are many modes simultaneously going on as the sun uh, vibrates like this. It's ringing like a bell. And they've been checked with amazing accuracy. And sure enough, I'm very happy to report that our solar model of how the density and temperature and pressure increase from the surface of the sun down all the way down into the center are quite well confirmed. I guess they're probably now confirmed with an accuracy down to about the five plus or minus five percent level. I don't, don't know the exact latest numbers, but just by seeing these waves passing through the sun, it's like a it's called stellar seismology. It's quite analogous to uh, geological seismology on the Earth, except we're applying it to the sun. So. That's great. Then, sure enough, Arthur Eddington's simple estimates of what the temperature in the center of the sun and the density in the center of the sun are turn out, when you use the sophisticated models, turn out to be confirmed quite accurately. So then, as long as the nuclear fusion reactions follow the laws that we think they should under those conditions, then they should all be going at the rates that we predict. And I said there was a whole chain of nuclear reactions that we believe are taking place that eventually has the effect of combining the four hydrogens into one helium nucleus. But how would you check that it's actually going on right now? Well, the, here's the problem with this. If you were to only look at the power coming out of the sun now, the heat, the light coming out of the sun now, all that tells you is that our models and our computations and calculations of nuclear reactions were correct over the last 10 or 20, 50 million years of the sun's history. Why do I say that? Because the power, the light, the energy that you see now, it's basically photons coming out of the surface of the sun, originated as gamma rays, as very high frequency, uh, highly energetic light rays in the center of the sun tens of millions of years earlier. We're not seeing the power that's being generated right now at this moment because that power will only gradually leak out of the sun over the next, as I said, tens of millions of years. Wow! Think about how amazing that is. What a weird statement. These photons are, after all, 
Once they're created, they always travel at the speed of light. They can't travel any less than the speed of light. But they are not coming out in a straight line. It's the most tortured, random walk here. They bounce into one atom. They get absorbed. They bounce again. They absorb, bounce again, millions of times a second. So the actual path of these photons is just back and forth and back and forth, almost seemingly forever, with a slight tendency to end up further and further out over millions of years. And eventually they get into the higher upper parts here, and they finally manage to escape when they reach the, the visible surface. So we don't actually know what nuclear reaction rates are instantaneously, I mean right now, in the sun. We would see all of the same things, everything would look exactly the same, even if the sun had not had a single nuclear reaction for the last 10 million years. We wouldn't know any different. Uh, all of these other tests and so on that you can check would come out the same. I need a way to find out right now, are those nuclear reactions happening at, the, at this, as we speak, at this very moment? And that means that I'm going to need to look at something that comes directly, instantly, without delay, from the center, from the core of the sun, from the furnace of these nuclear fusion reactions. And the only thing I've got, and I mentioned it before, which comes out unimpeded, at the speed of light, straight at us, in eight minutes, is the neutrinos, except they're hard to detect. Ah, but that hasn't stopped incredibly ingenious physicists. So here's the point that I made uh, just a minute ago, which is that even though the photons are produced by nuclear fusion in the center of the sun, and this is uh, grossly simplified, right? The, the actual random walk path of this radiation of these photons just takes millions of years. All right? It says about one million years here to finally get out to the surface here. So it's a very slow, random walk for the energy to actually come to us. So instead, we need to check on the neutrinos that are predicted to be produced every second by the fusion reactions in the center of the sun. A very clever experiment was created. Let me see if I can show you the picture of the experiment first. This was a real brilliant idea. There's the guy, Ray Davis, one of the great heroes of 1970s astronomy. He decided that he liked astronomy, but he'd rather have his observatory be buried in, let's see, this is a homestake mine. This is about two miles under the surface of the earth here. So there he is standing underneath this tremendous weight of rock, and that's his observatory, which is a gigantic tank, basically, of cleaning fluid. Why did he go to so much trouble to dig a deep hole down here in this homestake, it was a gold mine here, and then put all this cleaning fluid in the tank. Turns out that Ray realized that cleaning fluid has a lot of chlorine, it's carbon tetrachloride, and there is a very small chance that, remember, these neutrinos are streaming through all of us right now. Oh, by the way, why did he go to the bottom of a mine? He didn't want any other high-energy radiation from outer space to be getting into his telescope. So all of the other radiation from space is blocked by a mile or two of thickness of rock here. Neutrinos don't care. It's just like a vacuum to them. They go straight through. They can come straight through the other side of the Earth, for that matter. The Earth is totally transparent to them. But the weak nuclear force makes it possible occasionally, very rarely, but just occasionally, for a chlorine atom to be ch converted. It changes in its nucleus. Remember, you can change a neutron to a proton or back and forth. It changes from a normal chlorine atom to a radioactive argon isotope, which is not normally found in his container of cleaning fluid. It shouldn't be there. So what he has to do is he exposes this. This, of course, has uh, zillions and zillions of uh, chlorine atoms in here. He exposes it to neutrinos for basically a few weeks. Then he has to pump out all of the cleaning fluid by a very careful radioactive detector, a Geiger counter. And the Geiger counter is exquisitely sensitive, looking for individual radioactive argon isotopes and they were produced by one neutrino from the sun uh, converting them from chlorine into argon. So that's the experiment. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? When I first heard about this actually in the, in the 60s, I thought this guy's nuts. I mean, I was old enough to have that kind of opinion at that point. And of course, I turned out to be wrong, as with a number of my brilliant opinions. 
I uh, hope I'm getting a little bit better now at it, but it worked. This bloody experiment actually succeeded in detecting neutrinos that were converting the chlorine into radioactive argon that Ray was measuring in his Homestake lab, except, uh-oh, he was only measuring one-third of the rate of neutrinos that were predicted by the theorists who had their models of the nuclear fusion reactions. Oh my gosh. So for years and years, there was a debate. So are our models completely wrong? Maybe the sun is temporarily like to shut down two-thirds of its fusion power for unknown reasons, or there's some fundamental error in our calculations of gravitational equilibrium. People were really worried about this problem, but the most uh, favored explanation, which turned out to eventually be true, was even more remarkable. It turned out that neutrinos, okay, they don't have any electric charge, they don't have any electromagnetic interactions, they don't have any strong nuclear reactions. They have gravitational interactions, they have a little bit of mass, ever so little bit of mass. This is where they differ, for example, from photons. Photons travel at exactly the speed of light, they have absolutely zero mass. Neutrinos travel at slightly less, but almost, like 99% the speed of light, they have a little teensy a bit of mass which allows them to oscillate between three different flavors of neutrinos, only one of which can interact with the chlorine nuclei and produce the radioactive argon signal that Ray was looking for. So there, the explanation is that yes, their homestake was actually measuring neutrinos at the correct rate that was uh, predicted uh, from the fusion reactions in the sun, but when we now realize that there are three kinds of neutrinos, he was only detecting one-third of them. They oscillate on the way uh, between the sun to the earth, and that's an interesting phenomenon, which was only really appreciated in the last uh, 15 years or so, and that's going to have some implications about the universe as a whole in a minute. All right, so that's a pretty impressive experiment. However, I do have to point out that this was not really a decisive test of all of our ideas about fusion power in the center of the sun because these neutrinos were not the main neutrinos that were produced by the main proton-proton reaction that I showed you earlier. These are uh, a unusual side branch of reactions which wasn't really very certain and does not produce hardly any of the power of the sun. So it wasn't really a good test. The way to do the proper test was to look at some lower energy neutrinos which cannot be detected by this experiment. You need heavy water to detect them. There is a low probability that the main neutrinos from the main proton-proton reaction in the Sun will collide with heavy water. Actually what they do is they cause a teensy little flash of light. A little bit, a very small amount of energy is exchanged between the neutrino and uh, the deuterium in the heavy water and that's it. It's a very small signal, and of course it happens very rarely. So you have to have a huge tank of heavy water, and then you have to surround it with extremely sensitive light detectors, photocells, and just watch in that dark water, the dark heavy water, to see if there are any flashes of light when a neutrino from the sun from, will occasionally uh, encounter heavy water and produce this flash of light. This is an amazing experiment. It's like science fiction. Do you see what the, what's shown here? Here we are at the bottom of the Sudbury mine in Canada. There's a person over there for scale. We have a fish eye view of this giant sphere. I swear to you, this looks like something out of science fiction here, doesn't it? They have this huge tank. It fills the whole chamber here. It's inside the tank. It's pretty much the entire Canadian government supply of heavy water. They practically cornered the bloody market on heavy water. They pumped it all into this tank. It's ultra pure water. It doesn't have any other radioactivity in it. And they completely lined the walls of this tank with photocells, very sensitive, to look for flashes of light. Is that an amazing experiment? And by golly, I love these guys. 
they did detect the correct rate of neutrinos coming from the main proton-proton cycle that is in fact currently powering the Sun at the rate that we uh, predict that it has been doing for millions of years. So it turns out that the calculations are correct and it is a very stable process. And uh, we don't have to worry about the Sun conking out on us in the, in the next uh, probably billions of years according to this experiment. There's one other experiment I should mention that also used the same basic idea here except looking for even weaker light flashes not using heavy water but using a much much bigger tank of normal ultra pure water and there it is. How much water? This tank is huge. This is just part of the tank here while they're filling it up with the ultra pure water. There's a boat with three Japanese uh, physicists here. Every one of these is a Hamamatsu uh, light tube. It's basically, they're gorgeous things. They're about the size of a television tube like this and they're ridiculously sensitive to small flashes of light and there are, God, I don't know, tens of thousands of these things lining the cavity of this huge tank. Look at this thing. Actually, it's really cool. I've actually been to the, this is inside a mountain in the Japanese Alps here, so it's shielded from outside radiation. This tank is about four stories high. Uh, I was in that mine when they had a smaller version of this, and then I went back fairly recently when they were just covering it back up because they had to fix it. Very sad story. I'll tell you later about that. And uh, standing on the top of this thing is just, just amazing. It's one of the most extensive uh, astrophysics experiments that's ever been done underneath the planet. Anyway, this one also confirmed that, yes, neutrinos are coming from nuclear fusion reactions in the sun at pretty accurately the rate that we predicted. So we really do understand how the sun, and by implication, all other stars on the main sequence are producing their power. So that's really nice. The next thing we're going to do is to figure out about those other stars, how they might differ. And of course, the way they might differ is that they have either more or less fuel than the sun, and so they should have different lifetimes from the sun. In other words, what we'll find in the next lecture is mass controls the destiny of the star. Mass controls everything about how the star lives and how it dies.